So my career in computer science was launched one day when I'm sitting in the fraternity and a friend of mine, a guy named George Ernst, he's older, a couple of years older than me, uh, came in and he said, he said, I'm taking this course from this crazy professor, strange looking guy, but he said, if you want to get an A in, in my class, uh, just write it on the blue book in the final exam and I'll give you that grade. He said, whatever grade you want, just write it on the blue book. So I said, that, that sounds interesting. <laughs> I said, what is that class you're taking? And it was a class in computer programming being taught by the uh, world famous Alan Perlis. I used to say, well, back in those days, it was like um, building a log cabin with an ax. You had an ax and a bunch of trees and it was up to you to figure out the architecture of the log cabin and all the techniques of building it. And you just had to do it. So it was, that was great fun and adventures, even though it was extremely inefficient. Nowadays, you can get any, any program that you feel like writing. You don't need to write. You just need to find it on GitHub and you can write it. But then getting the damn thing to work still is a lot of a hassle. But now it's, it's, uh, it's uh, a big pain. So anyway, but I found that, so I just found that that world of programming was easy. And I guess to say, Perlis and the other professors were so enthusiastic about computing that, that it just drew me away from my interest in physics. Uh, so I started working at Xerox. This guy, Bob Taylor, who was my boss at Xerox, had gone off and hired the most brilliant computer scientists he could find from all over the country because he'd been funding them at, when he'd worked for DARPA. Taylor's an interesting character. He, um, he, he, he was, anyway, he was a DARPA program manager who initiated the funding for the internet, among other things, but he knew all these people. So he knew Butler Lampson as a brilliant uh, computer designer. He knew a guy named Alan Kay, who was world, had been famous at the age of four or something for being on the original Quiz Kids. Uh, there was a guy, another guy from uh, Berkeley named uh, Peter Deutsch, who was described as being the world's greatest programmer, and he, he was working at Park. So, so I went to work at this place, and that was, uh, that was a fantastic atmosphere of, of brilliant computer innovation. Oh, there was an article about Rolling Stone about Xerox Park before I got there, and in that article, Alan Kay is quoted as saying, the people here are amazing. They all have amazing track records of technology, and they're used to dealing lightning with both hands, <laughs> whatever, whatever that means. But the implication was these were godlike geniuses of computing, and indeed they were. They were, I mean, they were every bit as smart as, in their own way as my colleagues have been at Berkeley or Carnegie Mellon. We we're building a, a personal computer system called the Alto, which history showed was sort of the precursor for the Macintosh, which is the precursor for uh, Windows-based personal computing everywhere, along with networking, along with laser printing, along with all the innovations you can imagine, were essentially produced by a small club of people in Silicon Valley uh, during that time. We went to lunch, and Van Halen said that he wanted me, he was, wanted to know if I'd be interested in coming to Carnegie Mellon to run this project that was going to build this computer system. Scott Sartre was an innovative and strategic thinker. He said basically to IBM, okay, we're going to create a bunch of software for the campus, but you, you will be able to sell this at all the campuses of the world. Uh, and so we're going to, so even though we're creating the software, you're going to own it. Uh, and in return for that owning it, you're going to play, pay us 75% overhead on our costs. Uh, so this was, from Sire's point of view, this was a sweetheart deal. If you know anything about Carnegie Mellon, you know the Carnegie Mellon is, is always cash flow oriented. You know, we, we, in fact, Sire actually wrote an editorial saying, universities getting patents on their research is a, is a waste of time. Universities want to get the grants up front and let the research be in the public domain. So that was his philosophy about uh, university research. It wasn't that the university should try to hang on to the hang on to the intellectual property. So he just made this deal with IBM without thinking about it. And he said, I'm, and I don't. He said CMU doesn't have any money to to fund this ourselves. So you're going to fund the whole thing. You're, we're going to make a 75 percent profit on it, and um, and but you'll own the software. 
And I met this guy named J.C.R. Licklider, who invented a good deal. He, he basically made DARPA create computer science at Carnegie Mellon. I mean, he was, he was a seminal character that not many people know about today. I met him. I, I was on an elevator with him. I said, well, are you, are you still working at DARPA? Or are you at, you no. Know, he said, no. He said, I'm back at MIT now, but I've been at IBM and so forth. I've, I, I, I was only at DARPA for a few years. And he said, I, I've decided I like to repot myself every five years. And I said, oh, well, that's an interesting thought. So anyway, after five, so I've been trying to figure out what happened with my life. I said, oh, well, apparently that had a big impression on me because after I'd worked on this Andrew project for five or six years, I said, oh, well, I don't want to do that anymore. In the summer of, I don't know, 93 or something, Alan Newell announced that he was dying. And it was, it was like a horrible development for all of us. And, I, and I, I, I felt terrible about it. I, I was never really a close confidant of Alan's, but I was a huge admirer of his. I called him, so I called him up one day and I said, I'm sort of embarrassed. I said, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry this is happening to you. <laughs> and he said, well, you're not as sorry as I am. <laughs> I mean, he, was, he was such a cool guy. What I perceived to be one of Alan Newell's dying wishes was that we would be doing research in human-computer interaction in the computer science department. He'd had a bunch of meetings about this, and we were all supposed to rally around and create a, an effort in, in human-computer interaction, which was a combination of psychology and computer science with the goal of making computers usable and you know, using scientific principles to make computers usable by people. So this is sort of a new, sort of a new academic discipline or a, a, an amalgam of academic disciplines. He, uh, Newell had tried to start that, but he wasn't willing to do the administrative stuff to, to do it, and nobody else was. I was off starting my company. That was all, it was all happening in that period. But when I got back, I said, okay, to honor the memory of Alan Newell and to do this thing which needs to be done, we're going to start that effort. And so while I was supposed to be the nominal, I was the head of the computer science department, I was trying to start, the, I, saw, I said, we're going, to, we're going to go hire some psychologists and we're going to, we're going to study the way people use computers. So I, and I went there, I talked to a famous PR guy there named Regis McKenna, who happens to be a native of Pittsburgh. And he said, and he'd been the guy who put Apple on the map as, a, as their PR guy. And he said, if you don't have presence here, you're not here. And this was, 2000, this was the year 2000 or 1999. And at that point, Silicon Valley, you know, people used to say, Silicon, people in New York think they're the center of the universe. People in Silicon Valley think they are the universe. Like the people in Silicon Valley said, if you're not here, you're nobody. <laughs> so... Basically, I talked the university into starting a branch campus, and then through clever uh, negotiations and manipulations with NASA and Raj Reddy and a brilliant guy named Dwayne Adams, we got this campus started on the West Coast.